Go ahead, Jimmy. Thank you. All right, everybody, let's kick off this grand rounds. Thank you, everybody, for, for being here. And I feel, uh, thank, uh, of course, Dr. Sandoval, uh, who is actually semi-giving this grand rounds in person. He is here, actually, at IOL in the Olin Library. So it's one of the kind of a transitions I mean, if we ever go back to in-person grand rounds again. And uh, so let me go ahead and start with the introduction uh, with Dr. Louis Sandoval. It, uh, he's a licensed psychologist and research staff at the uh, Public Psychiatry Division at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center at Harvard Medical School. His specialization in the diagnosis and treatment of adults with severe mental illnesses and cognitive deficits, including psychosis and, and mood disorders. And he has worked uh, all over the world, and especially in Mexico, Central America, and here in the U.S., with nearly 16 years uh, of experience. His uh, clinical and research interests include digital psychiatry, something that we'll, we'll be talking about today, cognitive remediation and psychosis and mood, and mood disorders, and cross-cultural diagnoses. And so over the past nine years, he has served as principal and co investigator on multiple studies, uh, integrating technology to provide access and clinical services for mental health care. Uh, his studies involve collaborations with Harvard University, the American University, Dartmouth College, the University of Texas in Austin, and NASA. Yeah. His current work focuses on designing and evaluating uh, to reduce Art, Art, I think your microphone is on. That's kind of where we are. So I don't know that I have anything I can offer you right now. And that would depend on availability in the future. Jimmy, you're muted. Jimmy, just unmute yourself. Oh, so now I'm, I'm now I'm muted. <laughs> his, his current work focuses on designing and evaluating new technologies uh, to treat psychiatric symptoms and improve cognitive functioning in individuals with cognitive decline due to medical and or psychiatric conditions. Uh, his latest research is how bilingualism could play an important role in protecting the brain from cognitive decline in psychiatric condition. And he's here to talk about how to use technology in mental health care and which we've actually just been experiencing about all the technical things that can happen just in the introduction of our speaker. So without further ado, Dr. Luis Sandoval. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Choi, and thank you uh, everyone for, uh, for being here, first of all, for this uh, grand round. Uh, for those who are eating at the moment, bon appetit. For those who just finished, well, I hope uh, this presentation will be light as your lunch. Uh, so <clears throat> I want to be talking about, let, let me put the expectations of the presentation. Uh, I'm not showing a lot of data. I'm not showing a lot of the stats. It's going to be more about, uh, you know, the relational component of patients using technology. So from their point of view, um, I'm privileged to, uh, you know, to share this or to be the voice of these patients. Uh, I asked for their permissions and they were really, really happy that I was, you know, presenting uh, to you guys about their journey and their story. Um, however, uh, I want to present a little bit of, you know, some, some numbers that uh, put the, their journey into a bigger context. Um, so I guess I can move the, the slides now. Uh, so... Yeah, yeah. There is no, there is no uh, you know, commercial support for this activity. There is no financial disclosure. Um, we're just doing this for, for uh, educational purposes. So the, <clears throat> I want to start with the title, which is Improving Mental Health Through Technology. Uh, but in these cases, are, there are two clinical cases from the patient's perspective. And, and I want to say this. Usually or the majority of the presentations about digital psychiatry is like, you know, the doctors telling the patients what to do and how to do it and how to respond. Uh, for this pres uh, presentation, it's quite the opposite. 
they they told me what they were doing. They told me how they improve, which I was completely unaware. But they have the trust to share with me their journey, and and I think it's worth to to share with other clinicians to be aware of this, and also to to try to meet the patients and the clinicians in the middle, so we can build a more strategic and effective uh, treatment interventions for them. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna start. So as you know, in, in the US, we have a lot of health disparities. Uh, there's estimated that around 80, 84 million do not receive mental health care services. And if they receive a reduced services because of the surges of the community mental health care providers. So this is no new news. We know that you know, working here is a, is a good uh, uh, evidence that we, the majority of the time we don't have the resources to see all the patients. But that doesn't stop there because even though we have a surge with, with the providers, the patients are increasing. And, and this is even pre-COVID, now with post-COVID, post -COVID, we know that the mental health has been in huge demand. Um, we know that healthcare challenges still not providing access and high quality and also the, the costs are very, very expensive, not only, not only for the clinics, uh, uh, you know, to pay the clinicians, the resources, the facility, but also it's very, very expensive for the patients. And just, um, just mentioned here, depression, which is one of the most typical one uh, that is very expensive. Can you imagine how expensive it will be for psychosis or other major psychiatric conditions? And over the past I will say now 20 years, telemedicine has been used to reduce times for consultation, diagnosis, and treatments while reducing the need for clinical visits. This was true before the pandemic and now post-pandemic, it's becoming the, the, the model to follow. Now, just to, just to show some numbers, and this is coming from the American Psychological Association, uh, since I'm going to talk about two patients here, one with psychosis and the other one with psychosis and autism, I just wanted to show you how, you know, how the workforce treatment uh, is working right now. So if you look at the, uh, at, the, at the table here, clinicians who say that they work very frequently with patients or clients with a schizophrenia spectrum disorder, we have around 100, 100 clinicians working very frequently. If we use these numbers and combine it with autism, which can be like in, in the neurodevelopmental disorders, we have another 200. And if you want to add the neurocognitive, that would be another 300. So the total amount of clinicians working frequently, which that's what these patients need, they need a frequent, a frequent treatment we have less than, than 700 people uh, working for this population. And these numbers are nationwide. So that's pretty shocking. And I want you to think about this in a, in a, in a global context, not necessarily at the Institute of Living that is, specializes on it or in other you know, first episode programs. But if we expand this, we know that we don't have enough providers, which I'm pretty sure is not shocking for you guys. So, as I said, telemedicine, uh, you know, has been used to reduce the times of the consultation. It has been used to reduce medical disparities. And also, now we know, now there's more research about the use of telemedicine to improve healthcare access, and also that can bridge the gap between the patients and provider regarding social and cultural barriers. Here, is a, an, an integration model that uses clinicians and technology. Usually, we have three levels. One is how we use technology uh, between clinicians. And we have used this in the past probably 20, 30 years, where we communicate to each other, sending notes, sending reference, saying, hey, you know, um, uh, you know, this is a case, this is the patient. Uh, in terms of, you know, areas who have been used in telemedicine longer than psychiatry and psychology have been dermatology, radiology, because it's very easy to share documents to check, uh, you know, the skin, to check an x-ray, things like that. But then the model evolved and evolved uh, to clinicians to patient. 
again, before the pandemic, very, very few clinicians were using the video, the phone, uh, sometimes email to contact them. It was more about, uh, you know, setting appointments. But now he's been using for chronic care, chronic conditions, people in isolation. But the new wave, which I think this is the, the, this is the foundation for what I'm gonna talk uh, later, is how patients are using the mobile health technology. Uh, as, as, as we know now, it's very common that every single citizen, at least in the US, has a certain kind of a smartphone. And with the smartphones comes with downloading apps, you know, uh, checking the blood pressure, checking the oxygen, and the patients have been using this for medical reasons, for wellness, but also for psychiatric uh, reasons. And I think this is the part that as clinicians and researchers, we have to pay more attention because they're very, they're, the, the patients are very creative and they're very innovative. And as I mentioned before, they know that there are not enough resources uh, in the clinics and the communities or even in the private practice. They know it's expensive, but they are so tired of having the symptoms that they're coming up with very creative ways to do it. As I, you know, showing here the typical iceberg um, picture, we, I believe that we just know a little bit of the tip of the iceberg about how patients are using the technology. We know a little bit how clinicians and researchers want to implement the technology. And, but the, the big, big question remains still that how patients are using the technology. And we know they're using sometimes in a very successful way, and sometimes they're used in a very, very bad way. Um, just to give you an, a, an example of how the, the mental health apps are available currently in the App Store. In 2015, very, very few clinicians will believe that, you know, cl clients or clinicians will use a computerized intervention to, to assist, you know, patients with, you know, symptoms with depression, anxiety, uh, eating disorders, PTSD, schizophrenia, social cognition, etc. So we went from less than 30,000 and six years later, we're about to get into 60,000. So here is the potential versus the reality increasing number of health apps. If you go to uh, Play Store and Apple Store and you type health apps, you will find close to 25,000 apps available. Some, some of them will be free, some of them will charge a little bit, some of them will charge a lot. But there is 25,000 apps. If you sort it out, 10 to 20,000 are just specifically designed for mental health. Now, what's the re re reliability? What's the scientific um, you know, theory behind it? That remains a, a big question. But nevertheless, the patients are downloading this, are using this, are searching for this. So uh, as I said, you know, if, if you have between 10 to 20,000 mental health apps, some of those apps will make a bulk claims. Some of them are very dangerous. Some of them are useful. And as I said, patients are using them right now with and without uh, the permission or the consent or even the, the, the awareness of the clinician. Uh, I wanna just uh, open a parenthesis here. If you have any questions, uh, please uh, just write it. Uh, I'm more happy to stop the presentation and try to answer the question. I want this presentation to be more like a dialogue instead of like a, just me telling the, all the information because I believe we can learn from each other and from the riches of your experience and my experience to talk about this. Uh, that being said, I will continue with, if you are curious about what are the things that you can do to be more aware of the mental health apps available? Uh, if you're a psychiatrist, you can go to the American Psychiatry Association, just go to the uh, psychiatry.org, go for uh, psychiatrist, and then look for practice. And they have a, a section that will help you how to rate apps, the model that they're using to evaluate that, 
how to, you know, a questionnaire. So you can, if you came across one of those apps and you think will be beneficial for the patient, uh, you can use it and you can recommend it. Uh, or if the patient has, you know, downloaded one of those apps, you can check here and say, oh, you know, I have good reviews, be careful with this, be careful with that. If you're a psychologist, social worker, uh, then you can go to the APA.org. As I said, they have been evaluated at least 10,000 mental health apps. And you have two options. One, they have a, a, a website called Let's Get Technical, where you can review the latest apps and tools for practicing psychologists. And there's very, very helpful. And I'm encouraged you to use this because patients are using it. Uh, I remember conducting a study where we asked permission uh, to look at just the, at the screen of their, of, the, of their smartphone and just to look at the apps that they have there. And we found that between, and this is with a, a population with chronic mental health um, uh, disorders, in particular psychosis, and we found that 70% of their apps are related to wellness. They use it for breathing exercises. They use it for uh, medication management. They use it to keep track of the appointments. They use it for, you know, uh, distraction. Again, there are many, many things that are happening right now that clinicians are not necessarily aware. But if you want to be uh, on top of this, you can check these uh, uh, pages for sure. This is a, again a, a model how uh, APA uh, evaluate the model of the apps. They, they look for safety, they look for efficacy, they look for usability, and they also look if the data of the apps are able to share the data in a useful way, especially with clinicians and other uh, healthcare providers. And once they check that, they can recommend some of the few apps that are available in that. Again, this is just for the information for you guys. But even though, <clears throat> this is a good example, even though patients are using the apps and, and they're desperate to improve their symptoms, uh, here, this is, this is an app for PTSD and, and look how many people downloaded the app. We're talking about uh, 114,000 who use uh, an Apple uh, phone, versus uh, almost half use an Android. But at then the next day, the numbers decline. And then if you go one month, you know, can go a little bit up and then use it one year, it's basically nobody's using it. And, and that tells us about one, the quality of the apps. Two, the consistency of the clients using these apps. Sometimes they, they see the benefits, sometimes they don't. But also it shows you that the people are desperate for clinical interventions. The people are in need to be helped for their conditions. Now, with a little bit of background, I think we're gonna end it up pretty, pretty soon with this, where you're gonna go, you know, go to the front desk and uh, the clinician, the case manager, uh, the psychiatrist, medical professional people will say, you know, you, you, you can't list your iPhone as a primary care physician. And, and this is not, I mean, this is kind of like a joke, but I think it's becoming a reality because again, with the prices, with the system, with the amount of people suffering a mental uh, illness right now, there are, not, there are not too many resources. And that's basically the, the background about how I ended up with uh, the clinical case with Mr. A. Mr. A was treating his psychosis with apps. And I wanna talk about his journey. We call it Smartphones for Smart Care. We were able to publish in the American Journal of Psychiatry this clinical case that uh, basically set the tone or at least put in, 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 in light what was happening with some of the patients using the technology. Uh, this happened in 2017. Of course, this is uh, pre-pandemic. Now you can see uh, more patients using this technology. 
But let me walk you, let me walk you through this. Mr. A, back then, it was a three-year-old Orthodox Christian single man who was from an African country diagnosed with schizophrenia. He lived in a, in a refugee camp for nine months before arriving to the US. And five months after he arrived to the US, uh, you know, he started feeling irritable, aggressive, disoriented, confused. And surely, you know, after being here in, in, in the area, uh, he experienced his first psychotic break. And then he was soon hospitalized for psychosis. And this is, this is very interesting because this is, a, this is a, a guy, a gentleman who was from a different country, who came as a refugee, who didn't know anything about the, the American healthcare system. When he was you know, talking to some people, they said, well, it's, it's more about the cultural adaptation. I think this is normal, um, but it wasn't normal. It was experiencing psychosis, but he didn't know how to navigate this, right? He was learning a little bit of, the, of that, but then his journey continued with being more irritable. He had a lot of lack of sleep, uh, constant interpersonal difficulties, not being able to understand the content and the context of his social interactions. Again, uh, at the beginning, the clinicians thought it was more a, a cultural barrier, a language barrier, but then later on, we found it was more about, uh, you know, the, the some of the, 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 the symptoms that comes with the, the psychosis. Then he started with, a, <clears throat> with the psychotic symptoms. He was convinced that the strangers on the streets were taking, um, you know, talking about him. Uh, he thought that Boston was, the, was to blame. So he moved to New York in order to eliminate the symptoms. Of course, uh, nothing happened in New York. He continued with the symptoms he was arrested, he was sent to an inpatient unit, he was discharged after two or three weeks, and then he came back to Boston because he had a couple of friends here. Um, what was his typical treatment for, for Mr. A? He was, as I said, hospitalized three times, paranoia, fear of being attacked, elevated mood. Mr. A attributed his relapse to the cultural and religious background, um, being mentally ill in his country and in his uh, religion affiliation is a taboo. So if you have it or if you disclose it, that means you're really weak. He didn't believe in medication. Uh, medication side effect when he tried was, you know, gaining a lot of uh, weight, uh, which was not accepted in his culture. Uh, he's coming from a, a particular community that if you even show a, a belly, it's a sign of illness, a sign of weakness. So he was very in between, but, uh, between should I get the medication and reduce some of the symptoms, but I will see it in my community as a very weak, very ill person, or should I just handle it in the way that I think is the best for me? No? Um, because he didn't know the system and he had troubles uh, speaking and adapting to, to the US, he had an unstable housing, unstructured daily life and intermittent psychotic symptoms to lead to homeless. Luckily, one of the public psychiatry units found him in the streets and they were, uh, they were able to provide some medication for the positive and negative symptoms. And as you know, and going back to the, to the original uh, presentation, we don't have a lot of resources. So the psychiatrists did their best and they were able to provide 20 minute sessions every four months because they were packed, there was like between six to seven months wait list. They, they tried to provide some uh, clinician uh, um, treatment uh, to overcome the paranoia, to deal with mood symptoms and coping skills. And then the sessions range for 45 minutes every two weeks. This is very standard, at least, at least from um, in, 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 the, in the settings that, I, that I, I supervise and I work with. Again, because there's not a lot of people available to treat this and it's a huge demand. We were able to connect him with a, with a case manager, connect with resources. We found housing, food stamps, and other medical services, but the sessions with a, with a case manager were 30 minutes every week. So this patient was lucky for some standards. I mean, he had a psychiatrist, a clinician, a case manager. Uh, I've been in other parts of the country where they don't have 
sometimes they only have one of them. And, and even the sessions with the psychiatrist, for example, is every six months. Uh, or sometimes they have the clinicians, but not the psychiatrists on board. So he was very lucky in a way, but at the same time, Mr. A knew that he needed more, more things for him. So he basically said uh, in one of the sessions, I could not move forward with my life because I needed to improve in areas that were not part of the psychiatric treatment, getting and maintaining a job, socializing with the community, acting and reacting in ambiguous social situations. So he couldn't, he couldn't navigate that. He also struggled with the spider therapy. I need help to practice my social and emotional skills in scenarios to relate to my life circumstances. I need someone to give me feedback about what I do in those cases. I felt that my therapy could benefit from more frequent sessions and clear explanations about my conditions and symptoms. And at the end, Mr. A uh, said, you know, I, 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 need, I need more sessions. I need more resources, but I know that my clinician is not able to see me more frequent or the psychiatrist is not, uh, you know, see me more frequent or the case manager because they have high demand. So what he ended up doing was to be very creative and without the consultation of his team, he went to the app store and he looked for words that he learned from the clinic, for the treatment, from peers and said, okay, so I'm diagnosed with uh, psychosis, uh, schizophrenia. So what are the things that I can do? So we went to, for the app store, look for counseling for uh, schizophrenia, look for emotional intelligence, look for a speed reading, memory exercise, facial reading, breathing exercises, DVT. And, and surprisingly, he found plenty, plenty apps that were designed to target those particular areas that he was craving for. As he said, I was being creative in solving my problems and I needed extra help with my counseling. So I start, so that's why I start with the app store. So this is, this is the beautiful part of this case. He was aware, you know, with, with the resources that he had available, he was aware of the, of the areas that he was rusty. And he went to the app store and play store and looked for facial and emotional recognition. He found another uh, app that's called DBT 911. He, went, he found another one called Virtual Hopes Box who helped him to organize and plan several company strategies into, into the recovery agenda. He was even, you know, customized intervention including for positive thoughts, listening to music, practicing guided imagery, using controlled breathing. If you look at this section on the right hand, he was basically digitalizing uh, some of the, the typical techniques used in CBT for psychosis. He was also using uh, or digitalizing or creating his own intervention with his phone to start practicing facial and emotional recognition, something that he couldn't do with the clinicians because one, there's not enough time. And two, he was coming from a different country and he had troubles with uh, understanding the language too. So when he was trying to explain, uh, this, is a, this is a good example. He said, uh, when the clinician said, uh, have a good one, the patient was like, have a good one, what? He couldn't understand, not only because of the language, but also because he couldn't read the, the, the expressions and, and, and the emotions of the clinician. So he knew that he, had, he struggled with that. And he knew that he couldn't ask that question over and over because the clinician will be able to, to do it, right? He will be tired. He'll be like, okay, come on, Mr. A, let, let's move on. Let's try to do something else. Uh, and, and that was very frustrating for, for both parties. So, what were the advantage for Mr. A uh, using apps in the treatment? One, accessibility. It was very easy for him to go to Apple Play Store and type words related to what they wanted to learn. It was very easy to connect to an open Wi-Fi network. Uh, 
which is way easier than, you know, calling to a clinic and ask for uh, if one of the clinicians, psychiatrists, case, work, uh, case managers, social workers have an opening for him. Um, and as I said, you know, a lot of people have now the, the, the means to connect to internet via smartphones. Using the apps was very practical for him. He was downloading the app in a pra in practical for, you know, every single time. And, and this, is, this is something very funny when I ask him, how many times do you download the app? And he said, I, I download the app several, the same app several times. And I say, why? Because you can download the app, you can have the free trial. And when they want me to ch you know, charge for, for the advanced version, I just delete it, delete the cookies of the, of the, of the, uh, of the phone and download it again. So I was able to practice uh, the intervention over and over and over until he mastered uh, uh, at least the foundations for it. So it was very, very, very uh, creative. Uh, also, there's a lot of minimal commitment using the apps. As I said, he could install, or uninstall the apps with seconds. Uh, so this is something that you cannot do in a clinic. I mean, you can commit to the clinic. The, the clinician has some responsibility to follow up, to make sure you're going in you know, the right direction. But with the apps and, and providing this, Mr. A was able to say, you know, sometimes I feel like I wanna do it, sometimes I feel I don't wanna do it. There's a lot of freedom uh, with a minimal commitment and there's a lot of freedom with you know, having these kind of interventions uh, in, in your phone. Um, but there is a lack of therapeutic alliance and commit and, or commitment and this is concerning. The autonomy with the apps is great, but at the same time, it's, it, it can bring a, a major uh, circumstances of dangers to the patients too and, and the clinicians too. Uh, the advantage of using the apps for him, it was affordable. Some, some of the apps were zero dollars and the most expensive one was $9.99, which is not even the copayment in, in some clinics, right? And again, the 999, he was able to delete it and install it again and then use it. And when they wanted to charge it, delete it and use it again. This is something that you cannot do it in a clinic. They were engaging. The apps that he was able to download were, for the most part, very fun and enjoyable. Uh, some apps are presented in a game like, like you know, Lumosity. Some apps are more uh technical where you have to put your information and they will help you to organize the medication that you have to take that day things like that um so but one of the downsides like the majority of the apps as, as you remember between the 10 to 20 thousand that are available the majority of them suffer from poor engagement and the user and the users they download it try it once and then delete it and that's a waste of money and energy and time Another uh, aspect of uh, Mr. A using the apps was the non-stigmatization thing. That was a crucial component for him because he can be himself. He can have, you know, a thick accent. He can ask, you know, he can question his own adaptation without feel uh, judged by the clinician or the system. Uh, sometimes the clinicians are not able to, to understand the thick accent of, of, of Mr. Ray, and, and that, was a, that was a challenge for him. And he felt really sad and embarrassed for trying to communicate something that he was not. So having an app that show you multiple faces from multiple cultures over and over again was help, very helpful for him to, to continue with, with his um, uh, treatment. Some of the challenges, and you probably are more aware now, is the privacy. Uh, the companies will say, if you want to use, just click on the terms and condition. The majority of the people will do that. I'm, I'm included because you're so eager to immediately jump into, into the app, but we don't know where, where, where we give it to them. Sometimes they don't have a secure storage. Sometimes they transfer the data to other people, other communities that, and our privacy is in jeopardy. The safety. Uh, the majority of the, the apps in mental health, they don't provide a, a good safety uh, um, situation. 
uh, several apps do not understand the context of these questions and sometimes they provide a call or response. Uh, sometimes the, the apps provide an incorrect information. And as you know, safety is a crucial component in any mental health treatment. There is very lack of evidence in some of the apps, uh, like they, they don't go through a, a rigid uh, clinical trial. There's few evidence, but they're cheap and they're sexy and they're engaging. So, uh, and if you put the word wellness or you put the, the, the word um, mental health to the app, people will engage, but there's no evidence and that can cause more harm than benefit. The efficacy, as I said, this is limited, limited studies, limited CRTs. The usability, uh, without high levels of patient engagement, apps cannot be useful. And in the case of Mr. A, eventually found several apps that were engaging for him, but that doesn't mean, I mean, on one hand means like, yes, it was very engaging, but we don't know the, the, the efficacy of that. And the last part is the life expectancy of an app. Uh, usually a nap uh, lasts no more than two, three months. If they're good, it will last six to a year. And if you're like amazing, it will last longer than that. But uh, a simple breathing exercise app or mindfulness or um, even the emotional recognition, uh, they tend to disappear pretty quickly. My experience, uh, you know, testing on a lot of apps and recommending these apps is because the apps are designed by engineers and people with marketing backgrounds, but they don't have a lot of input from clinicians. And there are very, very, very few apps that are designed with the clinician mind to benefit the patient. So I think that's why we have a lot of discrepancies and poor quality in the apps. There's another component now with the apps that they, it's very hard to share the data with, uh, with the clinicians. I think it's important because uh, even those patients who are uh, fortunate to have psychiatrists, case managers, social workers, you know, therapy once a week, uh, there's still plenty of hours that they're spending in the community and we don't know a lot what's happening. So it will be great if we can share the information with them so we can have a more, a better understanding of how they're progressing in, in their treatment. So that's why we, we recommend to ask patients if they're using any apps, uh, like in the, in the same way that the, the sometimes we use about like, hey, are you taking any supplements uh, in your diet? Questions so far before I continue with another case, which is uh, uh, Mr. S. I wanna spend two, maybe a minute or less. Uh, if not, I will continue. All right, so this case is a little bit more complicated in terms of the diagnosis. Mr. Case is, uh, it's, um, has a dual diagnosis with a schizophrenia and autism spectrum disorder. So on one hand, the, you know, his, uh, the, the autism spectrum disorder came with a lot of uh, social uh, cognitive deficits. And then when he reached the uh, uh, early adulthood or late adolescent, he was hit with a psychosis. So we have a double situation that require a lot, a lot of intervention. Mr. S is a, 20, it's a 23 year old Christian single man born and raised in the US. So we don't have the cultural component of the, of the, uh, of the barrier of language like Mr. A uh, was living with both parents and two weeks after joining college, he felt irritable, confused, paranoid, and unable to understand social cues from parents and friends. He was soon hospitalized for psychosis. His symptoms was, you know, high level of anxiety, irritable mood, lack of sleep, constant interpersonal difficulties, and, and, and highly self-critical of himself. As you can tell, Mr. S has both of the most severe um, symptoms in, in each of the diagnoses. What was his treatment as usual? Again, his treatment as usual, uh, Mr. S is, it was in Boston. So we, luckily we have a lot of resources in Boston uh, from the private or public um, um, resources. So he had a psychiatrist, he had a clinician, 
he went to group therapy and he had a case manager. This is a premium treatment, treatment as usual. However, and this is, the, this is the part, that was not enough for him. Even though he was sent to a uh, first, um, psycho, uh, first psychosis program, um, he continued with mild positive symptoms, moderate negative symptoms. But the, 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 the key part of Mr. A is that he continued with severe social cognitive deficits. He couldn't read his own emotions uh, as well as emotions of the other. He, he, he couldn't connect with people. So these are direct quotes from him. It's like, I always wanted to have friends, but I, I don't know why it is hard for me to have them. I went to college and for the first time I was about to live outside my house and with people that were not, they were not my family. I was very excited about it. But during the first couple of days, at the dorm, I have my first psychotic episode. That ruined my life. That changed my life forever. So this is a guy who really wanted to, you know, to, to, to experience something outside of the, the typical treatments, to, 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 to experience more social connection. But then the psychosis kicked in. Um, Mr. S didn't remember a lot of the psychotic break as usually happens, but he had an, a, an experience that marked his life where he was in the inpatient unit. Uh, he, you know, he was, a, he, to mention it was like a terrifying experience of my life. I couldn't understand why that happened to me. I couldn't connect with other patients or with the clinicians in the unit. I was terrified. I missed my house, my parents and my environment. However, one day, one of the doctors told me that in order to get back to my house, I needed to improve my socialization. So, Usually the programs, the FED programs, the psycho uh, early psychosis, chronic psychosis, outpatient, partial hospitals are face-to-face, -face. but he couldn't connect with the face-to-face. -face. That was too much. That was too overwhelming. Some clinicians might say, well, that's the, 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 we can do some exposure, uh, but, but he couldn't manage. The exposure was too anxiety provoking. And, and, and he decided to do something else. Right, he said, "I'm attending all these groups, and my peers want to talk to me, but I'm very anxious around them. I feel overwhelmed by them, and it's very hard for me to communicate." The hardest part for face to face, as you know, whether you have you're in the spectrum of the autism or you're uh, with, with, with the, the psychosis, interact with another people is really, really hard. It's it sometimes is is one of the biggest impairments, right? And when he, had, when he was in the inpatient unit, his experience was traumatic. He, he thought that he could, you know, he saw himself living in one of those units forever. And that was very, very scary for him. So once again, he, he was very innovative and he decided to improve his social cognition with video games, forums, and online gaming. And this is the beauty of this case because he learned that using video games was a one way to remove all the senses that you need to, in order to, to interact with a face-to-face -face person. And I think that's very, very clever and very unique way to, to solve this. Uh, and I want to explain how he did it. He even shared with me this, the you know, step-by-step -step process. So, he started with playing alone video games, then playing video games and joining a chat forum. The third step is playing video games, chat forums, and audio communication with only one player. Then playing video games. Now he, he's not using the chat forum and was using the audio and the communication with one player. And finally, he was sometimes playing video game, audio and visual communication with other players. As you can tell, and I want to illustrate here, he was able to almost like to turn off some of the senses so he can channel one way of communication through one of the senses. Otherwise, it was overwhelming. You know, the typical playing alone video games. We know a lot of, you know, er, you know adolescent kids, adolescent, early adults, even adults are playing video games. And I have seen, you know, a lot of uh, my, my patients and clients using video games 
as a way of distracting, as a way to just spend time. I don't want to deal with the voices. I don't want to deal with hallucinations. I don't even want to deal with my parents or the clinicians. I just want to spend some time alone, right? Because it's very hard to, to, to be connected with sometimes with the reality and, and, and the symptoms. In the step two, Mr. S was playing video games and joining the chat. And this is the beauty of this because he was able just to see just one channel of communication. He was not hearing, he was not talking, he was not touching or interacting with people. He was just learning the communication, the, the, the written communication. And that, you know, censoring the other, the, the other senses was helpful to, for him to start learning how they communicate in a verbal way. Nobody was able to see him. Nobody was able to criticize him. He was just like putting a, you know, a, a one foot in, in, into the water just to test the water. He spent probably between three to four months just doing this process. Once he felt more, more uh, confident about it and start recognizing people from the chats, he was able to transition to the next, next level. The next level was playing video games, chat forums, and audio with one player. I, I don't know, but I think this is now very typical, the Zoom meeting where how do, you, how do you present yourself if you're only with audio versus how do you present if there's audio and video? Um, when I, when I talked to Mr. S, I said, well, why, I mean, explain the process, why you were able to do this. And he said, because looking presentable, it's, it's pretty hard. I mean, I want to be connected, but I don't want to put my, a jacket. I don't want to put, uh, you know, I just want to just interact with them with my pajamas. I don't have to sit right. I don't have to be in a, a good hygiene or uh, dressing nicely. I know this is important, but for him, he didn't want to spend all his energy to do this when he can, you know, engage in a conversation immediately, just turn off the computer or the phone and engaging. Reading the context was very helpful for him. So he was knowing what to say based on those questions. He can be appropriate and reading body language. So that was a, a, a major, major breakthrough for him. With the psychosis, with the, with the autism, you know, the, the, the energy that he had available to connect, I believe he was able to use it in a very efficient way by eliminating the senses and just focusing now with the visual and with the hearing, because now he was able to hear the conversations. As you know, if, if, if you have the psychosis and you have the, the, the autism, it's very hard to interact because you have to pay attention to the nonverbal language. You have to pay attention to the eyes, the hands, the posture, the legs, and also the emotions that come with it. This, there was a very typical uh, you know, presentation of him saying, you know, hey, did you notice how mom you know, acted with us? And he's like, no, what do you mean? And, and the fact that he was able to, the fact that he, needed to say, what do you mean, was, was very hard for him and really impacted his self-esteem, right? So he went, again, using the video, the online forums, the online. So in this image, he's now connecting uh, more, more senses into the equation. He's focusing, he's focused the, the, the vision into the game. So he doesn't have to read body language. He can read just cars or speed or numbers or things like that that doesn't represent an emotional connection. He was able to talk to the other person, which he's already familiar in practice. He was able to listen that he's already familiar in practice. And that was an excellent way for him to start building more social uh, cognitive uh, skills. In the step four, he was playing video games. No. follow the conversations just with the audio and just try with one person. He felt more familiar, were more comfy with it. Um, as he said, as you know, it's overwhelming too many things to handle at once. But the way that he built how to plug senses 
to improve the socialization, I, I think that was the beauty and the success of this particular case. Finally, when, and this, this, this probably took uh, like a year and a half to go here, he was able to read, play, and socialize with other people without feeling ashamed, without feeling awkward, and now being a little bit more presentable because he now was able to create these connections, the emotional connections with, with friends in the community, which basically that's uh, uh, you know, what we want if we wanna teach social skills. Um, um. So why did online video games and forums work to improve his social cognition? Because face-to-face, -face, like he said, it, you know, is, he needed to find who to call, who to meet versus the video game. It doesn't require setting the whole logistics, right? You just plug in, you like the forum, you think the conversation is funny or interesting, you plug in, otherwise you're out. Uh, checking their availability. In a face-to-face, -face, you have to say, hey, what do you have to do for lunch? You wanna meet? Here, you just go to the console, 20, you know, uh, inches away from, from his bed or, or uh, where he's at. Planning time and day to meet, that was a struggle for him. Here, you just need to turn it on. Setting the location, hey, do you want to meet in the coffee shop, in my place, in, my, in your place? Here, it's just, you see how many people are there in the chat, and you're immediately going to the, to the room. Planning transportation is a hassle, especially during the winter here. You just send an invite. Hey, I'm available here. You want to meet? You want to chat? And then for him, returning home again, playing the logistics. Here you say, "That's it. See you later. I want to, you know, let's talk tomorrow or things like that." And you can live at any time, so you don't need to. He needed needed to follow the protocol uh, uh, for the face to face uh, at the beginning. At the end of uh, at the end of his, you know, building this this model of, uh, of social skills he was able to follow that etiquette. Uh, but at the beginning, it was very, very challenging for him. When, when we talk about like, what was a, another motivator for this? He said, without the technology, you know, the apps, the gaming available to me, I would probably be institution, in, in, you know, living in, in, in an inpatient unit frequently because it was hard for me to respond to traditional clinical interventions and in typical clinical settings. And, and I understand this point. He was afraid. I mean, being in an, uh, in an inpatient is not pleasant. It's hard. And he wanted to, to have his freedom. And he knew that he needed to really, really push through. And, uh, and he wanted to face that challenge. He knew that he had trouble with socialization, that he had awkward interactions at the beginning and continued to have uh, a little sometimes awkward interactions, but not enough to jeopardize a friendship or, uh, you know, to, uh, to turn this into a, a big impairment at this moment. Um, having, you know, building this, these steps was helpful for him to feel, you know, to build a confidence. He didn't feel socially awkward. Nobody noticed that, that he had a, a major psychiatric condition. Uh, he was accepted because he was able to play along and he, will, and he felt integrated with the community, which I think that's the overall uh, goal for uh, any of these uh, treatments. It is simple to handle one piece of the census at the time. It was an effective starting point. Instead of using multiple census, I can focus on one or two. And this is true, I mean, if he feels that he's having a lot of anxiety and he feels that having a, an online video with multiple people is too overwhelming, he can just shoot up one of those interventions and say, you know, I just, I don't wanna see you. I don't want to see me. I just wanna chat. I just wanna listen to you. So instead of using the five senses, he can focus on only two. And that's very, very useful for him to keep with the communication and keep engaged. Uh, so it's almost like a turn it off and turn it off uh, on and off uh, at his will which has been the successful thing for him. So finally, uh, and I know we're, we're getting into this, um, to, we can have more questions. What are the clinical recommendations that I can, I can share with you? Uh, first of all, 
we need to have a clinical humility and, and, and curiosity. Uh, clinicians uh, across the board uh, levels, uh, we're trained to, to, to be the experts in this. We're trained to be the, the last word. We're trained to guide them and to have you know, an authority. Yes, it's true. But we also have to be humble and curious about what are the things that are very useful for them? What are the things that are missing on the rent? And what are the things that they're doing already to, to cope with this? And, and, and we can combine our, our expertise to build innovative interventions. For example, there was a, 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 an old lady around 75 years old. He knows, she knows how to use the computer. She knows how to use the apps. And she's been you know, trying to improve her uh, mood for years. She joined multiple studies with medication, with uh, uh, clinical intervention, CBT, things like that. And nothing has you know, worked as effective as when she download an app that provides positive comments every single day. So she turns on uh, you know, her phone, gets one of the, a poem saying, you know, the, the sun is bright and shiny and your soul too. And that has been the best intervention for her. So when you ask that and say, you know, Mrs. Jones, you're doing this and this seems helpful. If you combine it with your expertise in mental, like mental health care, you can create a very effective, cost-efficient, practical interventions for them instead of you, you know setting like come to the to the office once or twice a week or increasing the doses of the medication things like that so i think we have to to work uh, in sync i will recommend to us uh routinely the patients that they're using apps uh sometimes and at this point i'm pretty sure that most of the patients are using app for well-being so try to talk to them and say, hey, how, what are you using and how are you using? And, and sometimes you might, might find the, the, the strengths of their creativity, but sometimes you might find the glitches in their, in their logic, how to use this. And, and this is where we can contribute as a clinician to say, you can keep using it, but have you thought about using it for this way instead of this way? Uh, we clinicians and researchers, we need to test the technology with clinical and scientific rigor. Otherwise, patients will test it without supervision and that could end up pretty bad. Uh, here are two comments. One, as a clinician, I know we're pretty busy. We, we have a tremendous caseload. We want to do our best, but I think we need to get more familiar with the technology. Uh, we need to play with some apps. We need to, uh, to, to, to dive in and see what's efficient, not only for them, but we can also use it for us. And, and hopefully come out again with a, a common understanding. Uh, we have to hold the use of digital health technology to the highest standards and see, and see them as a clinical intervention. Not because I'm presenting two successful cases, that means I will approve their method or I will approve you know, how they download it or how you use it. I mean, it worked in a particular way and I talked to them, but. I'm, I'm, I'm still not confident that we can generalize this and say, or recommend this for, if you have psychosis, build your own thing. Or if you have autism, try to, you know, uh, follow this particular recipe that Mr. S was uh, humble and, and willing to share with us. So we have to really test this and see the benefit and, and criticize, but also accept that they might have a, a very good and powerful uh, solution for some of the patients. We have to develop more best practice and guidelines of how to deliver this and how to integrate technology into or uh, evidence-based treatments. We need to know the limits of the technology as well as the limitation of the clinicians. Um, in my experience, uh, a lot of the clinicians who are trying to use technology are pretty afraid of using it because what if there's a glitch? What if I disclose you know, PHI? Why if I ruin something, why if I trigger things? Uh, every single one of us is using already technology for emails, for you know, sending memes to friends. So we, we have to 
eliminate the taboo and, and, and conquer the fear of using techno technology to combine it now with our interventions. Um, as I said, we need to teach and train clinicians how to use, monitor, and recommend telehealth services and technological devices. Uh, this is something that, as I said, go, go to, there are multiple resources. I mentioned just a couple of at the beginning of this. There are resources for psychiatrists, there are resources for uh, psychologists, social workers, as managers, because again, they're using this and we wanna, we wanna try to help them to navigate the system and their illness in the best possible way. And also we need to teach the families how to engage in telehealth and, 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 and the correct use of the apps because not because they hear that in NPR or because they hear that in London are, are, are running this experiment and they're you know, seeing this, they're eager to, to improve their health and they will download it or will have access, but they don't have the guidance on how to properly use uh, the majority of the family members they just want to have uh, you know, just to, to, live, to reduce the pain, the suffering of, of the illness and their family members. The summary and the conclusions, I think these, these cases highlight the, ro the role of technology has in psychiatry treatment, both outside the clinical settings. Uh, Mr. A and us are, are becoming the typical patients that seek treatment, especially now post COVID. And Mr. A and Mr. A's cases illustrate how patients are increasingly becoming more informed and proactive about their, their, their mental health care because the fact that they're using, you know, they're, Mr. A just typing the words in, a, in, a, uh, in, in the app store, DBT, where, where do you hear those words? In the clinic, right? Or uh, medication management, where do you hear those words? From the clinicians or uh, working memory problems. So that the fact that they're using these words that we tend to use with them and take it out of the context to build interventions, that means the patients are very, very proactive. And uh, as I pointed out earlier, there are more patients than clinicians. So we have to catch up with them and we have to catch up with their creativity and, and their ways to solve these problems too. Uh, in the next decade, it will be up to the clinical community to see that such technology is implemented as part of our reliable mental health standard of care. As you know, in some of the, now I have experience that you guys are implementing evidence-based in a hybrid model. And who knows what's gonna happen in, in, in January, February, we might go to remote again, but, but we now need to, to really, really dedicate more time to, to, to have a good implementation of these uh, interventions. Um, there's gonna be emerging challenges, including appropriate app content, uh, technical expertise, lack of regulation, uh, private issues. Uh, so it's very important as a clinicians to talk to the patients, to talk to the families, to talk to the clients, to talk to the, uh, to the boards, to the, uh, to the directors, to the community, to every single one involved that how can we do this in, a, in a, an efficient, secure, knowledgeable way to improve this. Uh, and yes, uh, we have the responsibility to create more uh, liter uh, literature about recommendations uh, and also to, to uh, help the community to avoid certain paths because that can be more, more harmful. Um, lastly, I want to express my infinite gratitude to Mr. A and Mr. S because they allow me to be their voice, to share their stories with me and for challenge me uh, the way you know, clinicians do our work and we have to continue to do our work in the future. Uh, I wanna thank you for, for your patience, for, uh, for the invitation. And I wanna open the forum if you have uh, any questions for me uh, about this. Dr. Choi. So you could, so that's uh, time for question and answers. You can actually uh, type the uh, questions into the chat or, or actually just uh, uh, right now, if you would prefer just to unmute yourself and actually just to ask uh, directly to Dr. Sandoval. Uh, so give you a chance to ask some questions. Wait.
Hi, it's uh, Dr. Shagan. Hi. Uh, I'll jump right in. <laughs> sure. Um, wonderful presentation. Uh, got my neurons firing. Um, so I guess um, one comment slash question I have has to do with uh, the the person's resources and their ability to um, be able to have a smartphone, be able to access Wi-Fi and sort of be able to engage in that way. We have some folks who can't seem to use these resources just because um, maybe generationally they, they're not tech savvy, they're not comfortable with it. But more and more, we have people who do a lot of things on their phone. And yet, um, you know, we, we often run into issues where people run out of minutes or, um, you know, are not living in a place where they can sort of easily access things without, you know, using up a data plan. So I'm, I'm wondering if you've encountered issues around that too. Oh, this is a fantastic comment, uh, uh, Donna. Mr. A, the one who created the, the, the intervention with downloading free apps, he had the Obama phone. I don't know if you call it like, 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 like this here, but they have the Obama phone, which is you know, prepay, some number, you know, some minutes, things like that. So he didn't have a reliable Wi-Fi. He didn't have the resources. He had a, a really, really basic smartphone. What he ended up doing was to be next to the hospitals where they have free Wi-Fi or next to restaurants. Can I, can I say brands here? I can't, right? He was outside of Starbucks and McDonald's. They have a free Wi-Fi. So he knew that it was his time to download and practice the training outside of McDonald's. No plans, no nothing. So, and with a basic phone. So when, when he was able to you know, that usually the, the, he's part of a community and the community is like, hey, what are you doing? He's like, you know, I'm here coffee, but also downloading this. So he was able to advocate and spread the gospel about you can do this, just download this app, which, you know, pros and cons, right? But the fact that he was no resources and able to use the basic phone to build this, it was a, a, a beautiful lesson on how to be creative to treat this, right? Again, outside of McDonald's or Starbucks, I'm pretty sure there's more, more places like that, right? So this might be a, a fantastic commercial for McDonald's if we, you know, he wants to sponsor us, right? Uh, but but it's, it's, it's possible and they're doing it. And I think that's the shocking part, right? Because as, as you mentioned, uh, Donna, I will feel the same. It's like, we need to provide hotspots to all the patients. We have to provide this. No, the infrastructure is there. We just need to be in between. We need to say, well, you have this. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And they will find the resources and the time. And to be honest, it's very discreet to be in McDonald's eating you know, French fries and eating it. And practicing facial recognition, that's a beauty. That's a beauty, right? I love it. And, and they're getting out of the house. So that's a win-win. Just they're, they're among people and they're also doing their, their task on the phone. Yes. Which then they totally fit in with everybody else who's sitting there too, by the way. Correct, correct, correct. So, uh, you know, and I just wanted to really... Uh really these discussions that have come up actually and it's just so more important now as Dr. Sandoval, Dr. Shagan was saying because of the pandemic and we're at this point in time where this is actually more paramount than ever. Um, we, we have time for actually one more uh, brief question, uh, a couple of minutes before we wrap it up. Uh, just wondering if anybody, oh, uh, there actually is, uh, and here it is actually from, uh, from Peter. Uh, he's, he's asking, are there any efforts to identify the profile of patients who will benefit from particular types of apps and which ones will have their mental health well being reduced by apps? So let, let's end it with that question. Dr. Sandoval? Yes, there are multiple efforts. Um, 
one of, one of the things, uh, as I pointed out in the uh, APA, they have a toolkit and they have not only efforts to rate the apps, but there are also efforts to classify people who will benefit from. The efforts range all the way from classifying, you know, uh, subjects with, you know, certain IQ, with certain cognitive deficits, with certain cognitive skills versus the one who don't. There are also efforts based on gender, uh, based on uh, age. And there's another one very interesting uh, is based on the kind of uh, cell phone that you're using. People who are using iPhones, they don't have the same psychological profile that the people who use Android. And that's fascinating. I mean, this is a, a huge you know, grant idea for, hey, Apple, do you want to fund this versus uh, 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 Android? But you can tell. So when you talk to your patients, you can tell what are the resources and you can almost create a digital phenotype. But not from the digital phenotype that, 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 that is, you know, going around the world, which is let's have a wearable, let's have your blood pressure, how many steps you, 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 know, you walk every day, where do you hang out? It's, it's a different kind of a digital phenotype, you know, a digital phenotype of what are the apps that you download, how often, why, who recommended? Because then you can look for the social connections they already have and the social community that they have available for them, right? Which is a different, it's almost like a phenomenological qualitative profile instead of a very rigid, uh, you know, uh, objective. I, I think we need to bring that clinical experience firsthand that the, or, or patients and community has and, and merge it to what we know uh, with, with uh, objective data. But there are pl plenty of efforts. I will recommend to uh, read or to look into what Australia is doing, New Zealand is doing, and the Netherlands are doing. Uh, why? I mean, they're on top of this because Australia and New Zealand are very, very isolated from the world. So they're using a lot of uh, uh, digital technology and they're using a lot of resources to what is the best intervention for a, a particular demographic. So also, if you're more interested into psychosis, you, you have apps, you have uh, studies that are classifying now. Uh, if you're more into depression, what are the, the is it's, it's a computerized intervention better than an app? Will you use it as an add-on, uh, as a standalone, things like that? There's plenty, plenty of literature right now uh, from those countries, uh, more than the, I would say in the US, Latin America or Asia. Thank you, Dr. Sandoval. You know, the, the, they're, they're always ahead of everything in terms of quality of life <laughs> up there. The, thank you very much, Dr. Sandoval, for your time and actually for your presentation today. And as part of our series uh, with all our staff as we transition to a very different type of uh, treatment and psychiatry that we're all uh, encountering now. And we just want to take the time to actually to wrap it up for today and thank Dr. Sandoval, first time, and for everybody here. Well, so. thank you so much, guys. I hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions, please feel free to uh, send me an email.